for the thank you. Thank you for this holy moment we're in. Father, that no matter if we're living in the hardest moments of our lives or we're living on top of the clouds, Father, that you are worthy no matter what season we are in, that you are worthy no matter what circumstances we are in. Father, that you are worthy no matter how much trouble we're in. Father, that you meet us where we're at. Father, I thank you that this, that your church is not a church that you need to pay a membership to. That you paid the price by sending your son, Jesus. And you are worthy of all our praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Give a round of applause for the Lord this morning. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's my privilege. Um, and I'm going to just introduce myself really quick because I don't think some of you might not know who I am. Uh, my name is Colby Lidstone. I'm the youth pastor and the missions team lead here at Summerside Community. And it is my privilege um, to be with you this morning. Yeah. And uh, just a sh quick shout out before I uh, invite Darren up this morning. Guys, I have, well, it's not me personally, but we have amazing youth leaders in this church. And I forgot, yeah, just give a round of applause. I forgot to mention this this morning when I was talking about camp. But, like, these, uh, uh, we had, like, f uh, probably six youth leaders coming that camp that have never experienced youth camp before that you know they were run off their feet and you know they were none of them some of them complained a little bit but by the end of it it was just a, such an amazing weekend and yeah Jim was one of them and Ann and and Claire is not here, but Claire was one of them, and Jen. And then, you know, Steve and Natalie Murray, and Tim and Amanda Linkletter, um, and Candace McLaughlin, and Jack and Shirley Ferguson, who were in the 70s, was there being the grandpa and the grandma of camp. And it's just, and I'm sure I forgot a few people, um, but it was just an amazing weekend. Um, so. If you see someone that looks like they're really, really tired, they were probably at camp, and just um, thank, thank them, all right? Um, so, with that being said, I'm going to invite Darren Stretch up this morning, and um, me and Darren had the privilege of having donor egg rolls like a month ago and just chatting, and this man is just a wealth of knowledge, um, and he, he's, such, he's such a humble servant, um, and I'm just so excited to see um, where he's going to take us this morning. Um, so just stretch your hand out. I'm going to pray for Darren. Um, so Father, we, I, I, as, as, as we gather and as we are in agreement, Lord, I thank you for this man this man of knowledge, um, this man with a heart like David. Uh, I thank you for this servant, Lord. And Father, I thank you that what he's prepared this morning is what your heart wants us to hear. So bless him, bless his words, um, bless, bless his time, Lord, uh, as he takes this morning. And um, yeah. I thank you for his family and um, how they're such a, a, a crucial part of this body, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm new, me, so it's going to take me a minute to uh, get uh, organized. There we go. 
just gonna ask Colby to look at my butt to see if I had a green light on, but seems like my microphone's working. So this is good. Everybody can hear me? Good. Looking out at, uh, at the faces, I can uh, tell that half of you are thinking, him? Oh no. And the other half of you are thinking, him? Oh yeah. And the last half of you, I think that's how it goes, the last half of you are thinking, hmm, what did I miss? Yeah. I think that's right, half, half, half makes a, a whole, yeah? Me, me, me math good, me math good, that's what I want you to understand today. And speaking of math, I'm going to be hosting a financial wellness workshops here at the church, so if money is something that you're concerned about and you want hope and encouragement from a financial situation, I would encourage you to come out to one of the three financial workshops we're hosting here at the church. One is Wednesday the 16th at 1 p.m. here at the church. We're hosting a second one Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. on Zoom, and then we're having our third and final financial wellness workshop here next Sunday, immediately following church at 12.30. It's just going to be an hour of your time, and we're going to talk about things like savings, charitable giving, avoiding taxes, eliminating debt, and some other things. Like we're going to have a chance to uh, get some questions, answer your questions, and point you in that point you in directions where you can get uh, specific help for your own specific financial situation. So if um, money is a matter of your mind right now, do think about coming out to attend one of those, um, one of those uh, workshops. But for now, I'm just going to talk to you today about a biblical philosophy for money and life. And it's all derived from James Chapter 1. So James chapter 1, verses 2 through to 18, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother, in humble circumstances, ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The first thing I want you to understand is that trials encompass both poverty and and riches. So whether you are, wherever you are on the spectrum between filthy rich, 
filthy, yuck, or dirt poor, yuck, dirt, wherever you are on that spectrum, you're going to face a trial or a temptation. In fact, an argument could be made, the richer you are, the more troubles you'll have if the words of Jesus are to mean anything. Because he said in Matthew 19.24, a giant cam- it's easier for a giant camel to go through an itty-bitty eye of a needle than it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus also said elsewhere, blessed are the poor. So whether you're rich or you're poor or somewhere in between, each is often used as a test of your character. Jesus taught the parable of the minus, which is more commonly referred to as the parable of the talents. And it's a parable of a unit of money, a measure of money. So whether you've been given a lot of money by the master, or you've been given a little amount of money by the master, or somewhere in between. We all have the same opportunity to please and bring honor to the master. Both riches and poverty are killers apart from grace. Both can choke the word. In Mark Chapter 4, Jesus taught the parable of the sower, and he spoke about the thorns that chokes the word. And he says, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of life. And worry tends to be the great problem of the poor. So the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. The deceitfulness of wealth is the great problem of the rich. So whether you are poor or you're rich, you could potentially choke the word of God in your heart. And the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making making it unfruitful. Both the rich and the poor desire things. When you're poor, you might desire a Hyundai Elantra, I don't know, or a jug of milk. And when you're rich, you might desire an Audi, I don't know, or, you know, a special bottle of wine. But desiring things, not being content with the station of life you're in, is a potential thorn, a means to choke the word in your life. Trials are a fact of life, yes, no? I have yet to meet a person who hasn't been weary or heavy burdened. It's even a burden to surrender to Christ, isn't it? It's not easy, for sure, to be a Christian in today's day and age, It's a trial in and of itself. In fact, it's when you read the Bible, an argument could be made that it that it seems mature Christian character can only come through suffering and perseverance because it must finish its work. Christian character also comes through work. God created us to work. He created us to work six days and take the seventh off to rest. God designed work to break us free from self-lethargy and laziness. Work makes us less selfish and puts us into the world of men and things and forces us to think of other people. The Bible describes... um, work as a blessing. In Ezekiel 5, verse 19, it says, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions, enables him to enjoy them, 
to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. So work is a gift of God. When we, are, when we accept our lot, that means when we are content with our riches or our poverty, wherever God places us on the spectrum, it is a gift of God. And as Col- Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, through our work, we also bring We work as if to the Lord, and we bring honor to God in our work, and others see our witness and testimony to that. So God designed us to work, to have income, to have money, Um, and this was even before the fall. Uh, The fall merely caused work to be toilsome and a burden, and an argument could be made that when you read through Revelations 22, we're, we'll even have work to do in heaven, in paradise. So it's not like something we are going to escape anytime soon. Sooner or later, though, we will all lack the wherewithal to handle trials. Trials just wear us down. And eventually, we'll just come to a point in our life where we just will not be able to handle anymore. As James says here in James chapter 1, wisdom is the answer to trials. Solomon asked for wisdom, and he got great riches too. It wasn't a prosperity gospel type of, uh, of a thing, but presumably he was able to make wise decisions because of his wisdom, and he was able to make good decisions, and that is how he was able to accumulate his wealth and riches. Joseph and Mordecai, and to a lesser degree, Daniel, And Nehemiah also practiced godly wisdom and applied biblical principles, and they were able to bring great riches and resources to their to the kings and the masters that they that they uh, represented. So, in a similar way, when we apply godly wisdom, wisdom and practice biblical principles, when we use godly wisdom, we will also be able to make good decisions that have good results in our life. When we obey God in this way, we glorify God. And those around us are given reason to glorify God as well. But yet, the Bible speaks of wisdom as being more valuable than riches. In Proverbs 3, verses 13 to 15, it says, Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. This word of God is the, ultim- is the, is the best thing It's the richest thing you could have. Even in God's economy, gold is described as asphalt in Revelations 20.21. The streets of heaven are just going to be paved with gold. So gold is really just like the equivalent of asphalt in God's economy. It means nothing. Solomon was ultimately betrayed by riches despite his great wisdom. Therefore, James says we should pray. We should ask God, as he says in verse 5. We should seek God in prayer. That was Solomon's big mistake at the end of his life. He didn't consult with God as much as he should have or ought to have. We must pray 
in the midst of our specific trials. We all, we're all facing trials and troubles and tribulations. We need to seek God in prayer. Whether our trials are of poverty, whether our trials are of riches, we need to pray for the strength to see them through. Genuine believers who bathe their trials in prayer can count on with absolute certainty the promises of Christ. In Matthew 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give you him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And Jesus said also in Matthew chapter 6, I tell you, do not worry about your life about what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than, than they? Who of you can worry? Who of you can by worrying can add a single hour to his life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O little, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, we are to pray Without ceasing, the origin of wisdom is prayer. Trust, the, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Trials, we need to pray without ceasing because trials, they might last a while. And the passing of one trial merely prepares us for the next. Yeah. How encouraging. I don't know about you, but praying unceasingly is a daunting task. Not sure if I'm up for the challenge myself. But prayer is about coming to God with an, air, with an awareness of our humble need. Consider this slide. Uh, there it is. Consider this slide, yeah. We need to come to God in faith without any doubts, as James says, and lay before him my sense that I need him. Look, is God nowhere? 
or is God now here? James leaves no middle ground when it comes to faith and prayer. Any wavering, any lack of faith is potentially an Achilles heel. Take you down. And the antidote for wavering is repentance. In James 4, 8, he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Repentance is not only confessing our sins, although it is that, but it, repentance is also a lifestyle of humility and endeavoring to orient our life around the one true God. It's coming to God in faith, seeking God in prayer. It's applying godly wisdom and biblical principles in our life as much as we are able. It's glorifying God in our work and in our vocations, whether we're rich or we're poor. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. A divided house will fall. Wavering, doubting is division. So choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. We live in pretty crazy times, yes, no? Uh, The war in Europe with Russia and Ukraine, the price of gas, inflation, the pandemic, mandates, should they continue, should they not? Do we really know what's going on? We live in crazy times. And it's easy to be anxious and feel like we're being blown and tossed by the wind. But the anchor holds. Peter stepped out of the boat, and as long as he had his eyes focused on the Christ, he was able to walk on water. But as soon as he was distracted by the waves at his feet, he sunk. We need to be like the wise men who built his house upon the rock. Jesus said, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who's built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. As James says, blessed is the man who perseveres, He will be given the crown of life. God gives you all that we need to succeed in God's economy. We don't have to strive for security. God gives it. Are you weary or heavy burdened today? Then I call on you to grab hold of the promise of Christ He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest, he says. In Isaiah, Isaiah says, come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters, you who have no money. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. 
Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. These are the promises of Christ. If you are weary or heavy burdened, come, Christ will give you rest. Come, you who have no money, Come by without money and without cost. Come. Come to the Christ. Dear Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my heart more than anything else in the world. Amen. Amen. Awesome. I get to have a friend up here. <laughs> that is so good. Well, Andrew's finding his spot. It's so good to have you back, Andrew. Welcome back. It's so good. Hi, everybody. I, um, I'm just really um, touched by a couple of things that Darren shared this morning. And I was making notes that I'm just going to find at the back of my journal here. Um, the, the, right at the back. Yeah. Um, he's, he started with this, this, um, this quote, um, rich or poor is a test of your character. And, um, my character has been more tested over finances, um, than I think just about anything else in my life. That just grabbed me. Darren. And so I just want to, as a segue to that, to tell a little story. Um, we've lived in Summerside for 36 years. And during that 36 years, we've lived in four different homes. And on one of our homes that we sold, um, after the real estate and the, um, going to the lawyer, we surely realized uh, we had made $21,000 on the house. And uh, she was thrilled with the, uh, the profit, as I was thrilled with the profit. And um, she said, this is so great. This Sunday, we're going to be able to give $2,100 to the church. And I took a deep gasp, because I was thrilled with the extra $21,000 for different reasons. And that was uh, a test of my character right then when she was obviously thrilled about something that I was not as thrilled about. So um, f for me, I've learned so much from my wife about the joy of giving and, um, and the wisdom that she carries. I, I just loved how you were tying in, uh, Darren, in your message that the essential component to who we are is the wisdom that we carry, and that's attached to our character, which of course is attached to um, how we live our lives with the Lord. And I used to preach these really lame messages on, and I, I can say lame, now being older, looking back, these three-point messages that God wants your time, talent, and treasure. And I, I think that's really lame right now because um, I've realized the older and older I get that when I became a believer in Jesus, I died. And he now owns me. And he now owns everything. Uh, and it's not just time, talent, treasure. He owns my every thought. He owns um everything inside of me, my soul, my fabric, my spirit, um, my, my hopes, my dreams. He just owns everything. And so um, it's, it's so much more. And um, I just, I, I'll finish with this because I, I, I can take, hold the mic and just keep going. <laughs> um, we had the original... Uh, treasurer of this church was um, Darren or Darwin Gilcash, 
and Darwin, uh, for 18 years, always said to me when we had a guest speaker in, Andrew, can't we give just a little bit more? Darwin's DNA was far more generous than mine was. And the DNA of this church is generosity. It always has been. It's always been. God doesn't need my money. This church doesn't need my money. The reason I need to give everything, including the $2,100 when I sell my house, is because my heart needs to give everything. It's for me, my sake. It, it deals with the toxins in my heart. This is not about God. This is not about the church. This is about dealing with the toxins in my church. And um, I just love that song that you started with, Heather. Um, all my life you've been so faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. And I can say with all of my heart that he's been so faithful and he's been so good. And um, Darren, I'm just so proud of you because um, I know your, your heart is generosity. And I know that you carry everything that um, it's what we carry inside us as leaders that is going to continue to prosper and bless this church. And I know with the awesome leader that we have as a church and Tracy and the awesome team that's around her with our elders, and the people that have been appointed to take their different lanes, this place can only uh, grow more and more and deeper and deeper. So I've taken way too long. Thanks, Tracy. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Andrew, I so appreciate that you have come up to share um, what you carry. I mean, Andrew founded this church and he carries um, some really important parts of the DNA of, of who we are. And it's very important that he has the privilege to be able to come and the freedom to come and share. So I just want to give you a high five. <laughs> and don't go anywhere yet. <laughs> um, I just, there's, this is a pregnant moment. I think this is an important moment. Um, and just to be able to say, can you see how God's ways are not our ways? right? They're not. And Darren, your message was just spot on when you talked about what, for us to look at what is our lot in life, whether you're wealthy in the middle somewhere or poor, what is your lot? And Darren, I just love that you said God gives us, um, well, God places you where you're at. God has put you where you're at. And so are we going to choose to grumble or are we going to choose to say, okay, God, you will give me what I need. You will give me what I need. And will we trust him in that? And will we grab onto his promises because his promise is Christ is enough. That's his promise. So as Andrew talked about, when we surrender, I'll just say, God, take it all. God is an, he's enough. His promises are enough. And so this morning, I just, I sensed as Darren was talking, I just want to open up opportunity for prayer. Um, I think that's really important. And I just was like, I want someone to, to partner with Darren and pray. So Andrew, this is perfect. <laughs> and so if you and Darren can partner and be together to pray, and Anne, if you can join me, if that would be okay. Um, and Heather, if you can just um, play the song that Andrew had mentioned. Um, and we can just... I just want to open up the altar, and if you just are looking for wisdom right now and navigating whatever you're navigating, if you're just looking for a touch from the Lord, we want to not let this moment go by because God wants to touch and He wants you to know that He is enough. Not your financial situation, not the world situation, not whatever it might be, that is not enough. Only He is enough. And if you need that reminder this morning, if you just have even your heart is beating like, I want more. I want to feel free. We want to pray for you this morning. So with that, Andrew and Darren will be over here, and Anne and I will be over here, and you can come for prayer. But even if you just want to come and just be in his presence and soak in the front, I'd welcome that as well. So Heather, I'll let you lead us.